don't forget to subscribe. Afterwards the wisest and most spiritual books from the greatest authors await you every day. And now buckle up, sit back and we'll begin. The Book of Murdered by Mikhail Naimi. Chapter 26. Murdered harangues the pilgrims to the day of the vine and relieves the ark of some dead weight. Murdered, behold murdered the vine whose crop is still unharvested whose blood is yet undrunk, heavy is murdered with his crop. But the harvesters alas are busy in other vineyards, and choking is murdered with an overflow of blood, but the cupbearers and the drinkers are fast a-drunk with other wines, men of the plow and pick and pruning hook I bless your plows and picks and pruning hooks, what have you plowed up the dreary wastelands in your soul so overgrown with all manner of weed, and thus become a veritable jungle, where fearsome beasts and hideous reptiles thrive and multiply? Have you picked out the noxious root and twining in the dark and strangling your roots, and thus nipping your fruitage in the bud? Or have you pruned away those branches of yourselves which are hollowed by busy worms or withered by onslaughts of parasites? Well have you learned to plow and pick and prune your vineyards of the earth, but the unearthly vineyard which is you lies woefully waste and unhusbanded, how very vain are all your labors except you attend to the vineyardist before the vineyard. Men of the calloused hand. I bless your calluses, friends of the plumb line and rule, companions of the hammer and the anvil, road fellows of the chisel and the saw, how skilled and competent you are in all your chosen crafts. You know how to find of things their level and their depth, but your own depth and level you know not how to find, Deftly do you shape a raw piece of iron with hammer and the anvil, but the raw man you know, not how to shape with the hammer of will on the anvil of understanding, nor have you learnt of the anvil the priceless lesson, of how to be struck without the slightest thought of striking back, and clever are you with the chisel, and the saw in wood and rock alike, but man uncouth, and gnarled you know, not how to render gainly and smooth. How very vain are all your crafts except you first apply them to the craftsman. Men trafficking for gain in the needs of men for the bounties of their mother earth and the products of the hands of their fellow men. I bless the needs the bounties and the products and bless the traffic too, but the gain itself which is in truth a loss finds not a blessing in my mouth. When in the fateful hush of night you strike the balance of the day's proceeds, what do you set to profit what to loss? Set you to profit monies realized above and over cost? Then worthless indeed were the day which you had traded away for a sum of money, no matter how great, and lost to you were all its infinite riches of harmony peace and light, lost also its incessant calls to freedom, and lost the hearts of men it held for you as gifts upon its palm. When your main concern is with the pocketbooks of men, how can you find your way into their hearts? And save you find your way into men's hearts, how can you hope to reach the heart of God? And save you reach the heart of God what life have you? If that which you esteem a prophet be a loss, how very great must be the loss. Vain indeed is all your trading except the prophets, be accounted love and understanding. A serpent is the scepter in the hand that is too quick to wound, but too slow to apply the healing ointment, while in the hand dispensing balm of love the scepter is a lightning rod forestalling gloom and doom, examine well your hands, a crown of gold studded with diamond ruby and sapphire sits very cumbrous sad and ill at easy upon the head swollen with vainglory ignorance and lust for power over men, I such a crown so pedestaled is but a stinging mockery of its own pedestal, whereas a crown of the rarest, and most exquisite gems would be too bashful of its own unworthy to sit upon a head haloed with understanding and victory over self, examine well your heads, would you be rulers of men? Learn first to rule yourselves, how else can you rule well except you be well self-ruled? Can a wind-whipped foaming wave give peace and quiet to the sea? Can a tearful eye project a blissful smile into a tearful heart? Can a fear or anger shake in hand keep a whip on an even keel? The rulers of men are ruled by men, and men are full of tumult anarchy and chaos, for like the sea, that lie exposed to every wind of heaven, and like the sea they ebb, and flow and seem at times, 
as if about to override the shore, but like the sea their depths are calm and immune to the lashes of winds on the surface. If you would truly govern men dive to their utmost depths, for men are more than foaming waves, but to dive to the utmost depths of men you must first dive to your own utmost depth, and to accomplish that you must lay down the scepter and the crown, that the hand may be free of feel, and the head unencumbered to think and to estimate, vain is all your rule and lawlessness are all your laws and chaos is all your order except you learn to rule the intractable man in you whose favorite hobby is to play with scepters and with crowns, men of the censor and the book. What burn you in the censor? What tread you in the book? Burn you the amber blood that oozes and congeals out of the fragrant hearts of certain plants? But that is bought and sold in the public mart for a penny's worth thereof can fully discommode any god. Think you the smell of incense can drown out the stench of hatred and be greed? Of quibbling eyes prevaricating tongues lascivious hands? Of unbelief parading as belief and sordid earthliness blowing the horn of blissful paradise? More pleasant in the nostrils of your god would be the smell of all these things starved unto death and one by one cremated in the heart and their ashes scattered to the four winds of heaven. What burn you in the censer? Propitiation praise and supplication? A wrathful God is better left to burst with his wrath. A praise hungry God is better left to starve for praise. A hard hearted God is better left to die of the hardness of his heart. But neither wrathful praise hungry nor heart of heart is God. Rather are you full of wrath and hungry for praise and heart of heart. Not incense would God have you burn, but your wrath and pride and heartlessness, that you may be like him free and omnipotent, and he would have your hearts be the censors. What read you in the book? Read you commandments to be writ in gold upon the walls and domes of temples? Or living truths to be engraved upon the heart? Read you doctrines to be taught from pulpits, and zealously defended with logic trickeries of speech, and if need be with money, and the edge of the sword? Or read you life which is not a doctrine, to be taught and defended, but a way to be walked with a will to freedom in the temple as outside of it in the night, as in the day, and in the low places, as in the high? And except you walk that way, and be certain of its goal, how can you have the temerity to invite the others to walk it? Or read you charts and maps, and price lists in the book showing men, how much of heaven can be bought with so and so much of the earth? Tricksters and agents of Sodom. You would sell heaven unto men and take their share of earth as the price. You would make a Gehenna of the earth and urge men to flee it, while you entrench yourself the deeper therein. Why do you not make men sell their share in heaven for a share in the earth? Did you read well your book you would show men how to make an heaven of the earth for to the heavenly hearted the earth is in heaven, while to the earthly hearted the heaven is an earth. Uncover heaven in the hearts of men, by leveling therein all bars between man and his fellowmen, between man and all the creatures, between man and God. But for that you must be heavenly hearted yourselves, not a garden and bloom, is heaven to be bought or rented, but a state of being, is heaven attainable as well upon the earth as anywhere within this boundless universe. Why crane your necks and strain your eyes beyond? Not a ringing furnace is hell, to be escaped with much praying and incense burning, but a state of the heart, is hell experienced as well on the earth as anywhere in this uncharted immensity. Where would you flee the fire whose fuel is the heart, unless you flee the heart? Vain is the search for heaven, and vain the evasion of hell, so long as man has held his shadow. For both heaven and hell are states inherent in duality, except man becomes single of mind, single of heart and single of body, except he be shadow less and single of will he shall always have on foot in heaven, and another in hell and that is hell indeed, I it is more than hell, to have wings of light and feet of lead, to be buoyed up by hope and dragged down by despair, to be unfurled by fearless faith and furled by fearful doubt. No heaven is heaven which is to others hell, no hell is hell which is to others heaven, and since one's hell is oft another's heaven and one's heaven, 
If oft another's held in heaven and hell were not enduring in conflicting stages, but stages to be passed on the long pilgrimage to freedom from both pilgrims of the sacred bind. No heaven has murdered to sell or grant to those who would be righteous. No hells to hold as scarecrows to the ones who would be wicked, except your righteousness, be its own heaven it shall bloom for a day, and then wither away, except your wickedness, be its own scarecrow it shall sleep for a day, and come to bloom at the first favorable season, no hells or heavens has murdered to offer you, but holy understanding which lifts you far beyond the fire of any hell, and the luxuriance of any heaven, not with the hand, but with the heart, must you receive the gift, for that the heart must needs, be disencumbered of every stray desire, and will save the desire, and will to understand, no strangers are you to the earth. Nor is the earth to you a stepmother, but a very heart of your very heart are you, and a very backbone of her every backbone, glad is she to bear you on her sturdy broad and steady back. Why do you insist on bearing her upon your puny, fallen chests and moan and puff and gasp for breath in consequence? Flowing with milk and honey are the udders of the earth, why do you let both sour with your greed? by taking of them more than you need? Serene and comely is the face of the earth, why would you mar and ruffle it with bitter strife and fear? A perfect unit is the earth, why do you persist in disremembering her with swords and boundary marks? Obedient and carefree is the earth, why are you so full of care and insubordination? Yet more enduring are you than the earth than the sun, and all the spheres in the heavens, all shall pass away, but you shall not, why tremble you as leaves in the wind? If nothing else can make you feel your oneness with the universe the earth alone should make you feel it, yet earth herself is but the mirror wherein your shadows are reflected, is the mirror more than the mirrored? Is the shadow cast by a man more than the man? Rub your eyes and be awake, for you are more than earth, your destiny is more than to live and die, and to provide abundant food for the ever-hungry jaws of death. Your destiny is to be free from living and from dying. From heaven and hell and all the warring opposites incumbent on duality, your destiny is to be fruitful vines in the eternally fruitful vineyard of God. As a living branch of living vine, when buried in the ground strikes root, and ultimately becomes an independent great bearing vine like its mother with which it remains connected social man the living branch of the vine divine, when buried in the soil of his divinity, becomes a god remaining permanently one with God. Shall man be buried alive, that he may come to life? Yea and yea again, except you be buried to duality of life and death you shall not rise to singleness of being, except you be fed with the grapes of love you shall no be filled with the wine of understanding, and except you be drunk with the wine of understanding you shall not be sobered by the kiss of freedom, not love do you eat when you eat of the fruit of the earthly vine. You eat a greater hunger, in order to appease a lesser one, not understanding do you drink when you drink the blood of the earthly vine, you drink but a brief forgetfulness of pain the which, when spent doubles the keenness of your pain, you flee from an irksome self, only to meet that self around the corner, the grapes that murdered offers you are not exposed to mold and rot, to be once filled with them is to remain forever full. The wine he has distilled for you is too strong for the lips afraid of being burned, but quickening to the hearts that would be drunk with self-forgetfulness unto eternity, are there among you men enhinjured for my grapes? Let them come forward with their baskets, are there any athirst for my blood? Let them bring their cups, for heavy is murdered with his crop, and choking with an overflow of blood. A day of self-forgetfulness was the day of sacred vine a day intoxicated with the wine of love, and bathed in the glow of understanding, a day elastic with the rhythmic beat of freedom's wings, a day of leveling bars and merging on and all and all in one, but two. What has it become today? It has become a week of morbid self-assertion, of sordid greed trading in sordid greed, of slavery frolicking with slavery and ignorance debauching ignorance. The Ark herself once a distillery of faith and love and freedom has now been turned into a huge wine press and monstrous trading mark. She takes the yield of your vineyards and sells it back to you as stupefying wine, 
The labor of your hands she forges into fetters for your hands. The sweat of your brows she turns into live embers wherewith to brand your brows. For too far has the ark swerved from her charted course. But now her rudder is set right. She would be rid of all dead weight. That she may ply her course with easy and safety. Therefore shall all gifts be returned to the givers. And all debts be remitted to the debtors. The ark knows no giver. But God and God would have no man in debt. Not even to himself. So taught I Noah. So I teach you. Chapter 27. Should truth be preached to all, or to the chosen few? Murdered reveals the secret of his disappearance on the eve of the day of the vine, and speaks on counterfeit authority. Naranda, long after the feast had become a memory the seven were assembled round the master in the airy. The master was silent as the companions reviewed the memorable events of that day. Some marveled at the great outburst of enthusiasm with which the crowd received the master's words. Others commented on Shamadam's odd and most inscrutable behavior during the moments when scores of indebtedness bills were taken out of the Ark treasury and publicly destroyed, and hundreds of wine jars and barrels brought out of the cellars and given away, and many valuable gifts returned to the givers, for he evinced no opposition whatsoever as we all expected him to do. But speechless and motionless he watched it all weeping voluminous tears. Benoon remarked that, though the crowd cheered itself hoarse, its cheers were not for the master's words, but for the debts remitted and the gifts returned. He even mildly reproved the master for wasting his breath on such a crowd which sought no higher pleasure than eating, drinking, and making merry, the truth, he maintained should not be preached indiscriminately to all, but to the chosen few. Then the master spoke and said, Murdered, your breath upon the wind shall surely lodge within some breast. Ask not whose breast it is, see only that the breath itself be pure. Your word shall seek, and surely find some ear. Ask not whose ear it is, see only that the word itself be a true messenger of freedom. Your silent thought shall surely move some tongue to speech. Ask not whose tongue it is, see only that the thought itself be lit with loving understanding. Think not any effort wasted, some seeds lie buried in the ground for many years, but quickly come to life, when stirred by the breath of the first favoring season for its springing up, all things are possible in eternity, therefore, despair of no man's freedom, but preach the message of release to all with equal faith and zeal, to the non-yearning, as to the yearning, for the non-yearning shall surely come to yearn, and the now unfledged shall some day preen their pinions in the sun, and with their wings, shall cleave the farthest and the most inaccessible reaches of the sky, Micaster, it grieves us much that till this day, and despite our repeated inquiries, the master would not reveal to us the secret of his mysterious disappearance on the eve of the day of the vine, are we not worthy of his confidence? Murdered, Wassiver is worthy of my love, is surely worthy of my confidence, is confidence more than love, Micaster? Am I not giving you unstintingly of my heart? If I spoke not of that unsavory circumstance it was because I wished to give Shamadam time for repenting, for it was he. With the help of two strangers, who had forcefully taken me out of this area on that eve, and cast me into the black pit, unhappy Shamadam. Little did he dream that even the black pit would receive murdered with silken hands and provide him with magic ladders to the summit, Naranda, on hearing that we were all awestruck and dumbfounded, and none dared to ask the master how he came out unscathed of what seemed to everyone a certain perdition, and all were silent for a space, Himmel, why does Shamadam persecute our master while our master loves Shamadam? Murdered, not me Shamadam persecutes, Shamadam persecutes Shamadam. Invest the blind with a semblance of authority, and they will pluck the eyes of all the seeing, even the eyes of those who labor hard to make them see. Give a slave his way, but for a day, and he will turn the world into a world of slaves. The first he would flail and fetter would be the ones who toil incessantly to set him free. 
all world authority, whatever be its source, is counterfeit, therefore it clicks its spurs and brandishes the sword and rides in boisterous pomp and glittering ceremony that none may dare look into its false heart, its shaky throne it mounts on gun and spears. Its vanity swept, soul it decorates with fear-inspiring amulets and necromantic emblems, that the eyes of the curious may not behold its wretched poverty, such an authority is both a blind and a curse to the man who craves to exercise it, it would maintain itself at any cost, even the fearful cost of destroying the man himself and those who accept his authority and those who oppose it as well, because of their lust for authority men are in constant turmoil, those in authority are ever fighting to maintain it, those out of authority are ever struggling to snatch it from the hands of those who hold it, while man, the god in swaddling bands, is trampled under foot and hoof, and left on the field of battle unnoticed, unattended, and unsolved, so furious is the fight, and so blood crazed the fighters that none, alas, would stop to lift the painted mask off the face of the spurious bride and expose her monstrous ugliness to all. Believe, O oh monks, that no authority is worth the flutter of an eyelash, except the authority of holy understanding which is priceless, for that no sacrifice is great, attain it once, and you shall hold it to the end of time, and it shall charge your words with more power than all the armies of the world can ever command and it shall bless your deeds with more beneficence than all the world authorities combined can ever dream of bringing to the world, for understanding is its own shield, its strong arm is love, it neither persecutes nor tyrannizes, but like unto do it falls upon the arid hearts of men, and those who reject it, it blesses no less than those who drink it in, because too certain of its inner force, is has recourse to no external force, because too fearless, it shuns the use of fear as a weapon for imposing itself on any man, the world is poor, ah, so poor, and understand, therefore does it seek to hit its poverty behind the veil of counterfeit authority, and counterfeit authority strike defensive and defensive alliances with counterfeit forces, and the two put fear in command, and fear destroys them both. Has it not always been that the weak would combine to protect their weakness? Thus world's authority and world's brute force go hand in hand under the lash of fear, and pay their daily tad to ignorance in wars and blood and tears, and ignorance benignly smiles on all, and says to them, Well done! Well done, said Shamadam to Shamadam, when he consigned murdered to the pit, but little did Shamadam think that, in casting me into the pit he had cast himself, and not me, for the pit cannot hold a murdered, while a shamatum must labor long and hard to scale its dark and slippery walls, a trinket is all world authority, let those who are yet babes in understanding amuse themselves with it, but you must not impose yourselves on any man, for that which is imposed by forces is soon, or late deposed by force, seek no authority over the lives of men, of that the omnivill is master, nor seek authority over the goods of men. For men are chained, so much to their goods, as to their lives, and they distrust, and hate the meddlers with their chains, but seek a way into the hearts of men through love and understanding. For once installed therein you can, and better work to loose men of their chains, for love will guide your hand, while understanding holds the lantern. Chapter 28. Price of Bether appears with Shamadam at the Airy, the colloquy between the Price and Murdad on War and Peace, Murdad is trapped by Shamadam. Naranda, as the master finished saying that, and we fell to pondering his words, heavy footfalls were heard outside accompanied by rambling, muffled talking, presently two giant soldiers, armed to the teeth, appeared at the entrance, and took positions on either side, with sabers drawn and glistening in the sun, then followed a young price in full regalia, with Shamadam timidly walking behind, and two more soldiers following Shamadam. The prince was one of the most powerful and far-famed potentates of the Milky Mountains. He stood for a moment at the entrance, and carefully examined the faces of the small company assembled within, 
Then fixing his large and bright eye on the master, he bowed very low and said, Prince, hail, holy man. We came to do homage to the great Murdered, whose fame has traveled far in these mountains until it reached our distant capital. Murdered, fame rides a fiery chariot abroad, at home it limps on crutches, of that the senior is my witness, trust not, O oh price, to vagaries of fame, prince, yet sweet are the vagaries of fame, and sweet it is to print one's name upon the lips of men, murdered, as well engrave a name upon the sands of the shore as printed on the lips of men, the winds and tides shall wash it off the sands, a sneeze shall blow it off the lip, if you would not be sneezed away by men, print not your name upon their lips, but burn it in their hearts, prince, but locked with many locks, are the hearts of men, murdered, the locks may be many, but the key is one, prince, have you that key? For I am in sore need of it, murdered, you also have it, prince, alas. You price me for more than I am really worth, long have I sought a key into my neighbor's heart, but nowhere could I find it, he is a mighty prince, and is bent on making war on me, and I am constrained to raise my arms against him despite my peaceful disposition. Let not my diadem and jeweled robes deceive you, master, I cannot find in them the key I seek, murdered, they hid the key, but hold it not, they foil your step, and balk your hand, and lead away your eye, thus rendering your search of no avail. Prince, what may the master mean by that? Am I to cast away my diadem and robes, that I may find the key into my neighbor's heart? Murdered, to keep them, you must lose your neighbor, to keep your neighbor you must lose them, and to lose one's neighbor is to lose oneself, prince, I would not buy my neighbor's friendliness at such a costly price, murdered, would you not buy yourself at such a paltry price, prince, buy me, no prisoner am I to pay a ransom, and furthermore I have a well-paid, well-maintained army to protect me, my neighbor cannot boast of a better one, murdered, to be a prisoner of one man, or thing, is alone imprisonment too bitter to endure, to be a prisoner of an army of men, and a host of things, is banishment without reprieve, for to depend on anything is to be imprisoned by that thing, depend, therefore, on God alone, for to be the prisoner of God is to be free, indeed, prince, prince, should I then leave myself my throne my subjects unprotected, murdered, you should not leave yourself unprotected, prince, therefore do I maintain an army, murdered, therefore must you dismiss your army, prince, but my neighbor would quickly overrun my kingdom, murdered, your kingdom he may overrun, but you no man can swallow, two prisons merged in one make not a tiny hearth for freedom, rejoice if man expel you from your prison, but envy not that man who comes to shut himself within your prison, prince, I am the scion of a race famed for its vealer in the field, we never force on others war, but when war is forced upon us, we never sink away, and never leave the field except with banners flying high over the corpses of the enemy, you ill advise me, sir, when you advise to let my neighbor have his way, murdered, did you not say you would have peace? Prince, I, peace would I have, murdered, then do not fight, prince, but my neighbor insists on fighting me, and I must fight him that peace may reign between us, murdered. You would kill your neighbor that you may live with him at peace. How strange the spectacle. There is no merit in living at peace with the dead, but a great virtue it is to live at peace with the living. If you must wage a war on any living man or thing, whose tastes and interests may clash at times with yours, then wage a war on God who caused these things to be and wage a war upon the universe, for countless are the things therein that disconcert your mind, and trouble your heart, and willy-nilly force themselves upon your life, prince, what should I do, when I would be at peace with my neighbor, but he would fight, murdered, fight, prince, now you counsel me all right, murdered, I, fight, but not your neighbor, fight rather all the things, that cause you and your neighbor to fight, why does your neighbor wish to fight you? Is it because your eyes are blue and his are hazel? Is it because you dream of angels and he dreams of devils? Or is it 
because you love him as yourself and holds all yours as his. It is your robes, O prince, your throne, your wealth, your glory and the things to which you are a prisoner that your neighbor wants to fight you for. Would you defeat him without raising a spear against him? Then steal a march on him and yourself declare a war on all these things when you have conquered them by ridding your soul of their clutches. When you have cast them out upon the rubbish heap, mayhap your neighbor will halt his march and sheath his sword and say unto himself, were these things worth a fight, my neighbor would not have cast them away upon the rubbish heap. Should your neighbor preserve in his madness and carry off the rubbish heap, rejoice at your own deliverance from such a noxious load, but grieve over your neighbor's lot, prince, what of my honor which is worth far more than all my possessions? Murdered, man's only honor is being man, God's likeness and image, all other honors are dishonors, an honor bestowed by men is easily taken away by men, an honor written with the sword is easily effaced by the sword, no honor, O prince, is worth a rusted arrow, much less a burning tear, much less a drop of blood, prince, and freedom my freedom and that of my people is not that worth the greatest sacrifice murdered. True freedom is worth the sacrifice of self, your neighbor's arms cannot take it away, your own arms cannot win it and defend it. And the field of battle is for it a grave, true freedom is won and lost in the heart, would you have war? Wage it within your heart upon your heart, disarm your heart of every hope and fear and vain desire that make your world a stifling pen, and you shall find it broader than the universe, and you shall roam that universe at will, and nothing shall be unto you in hindrance that is the only war worth waging, engage yourself in such a war, and you shall no longer find the time for any other wars which would become to you abhorrent beastliness and diabolic tricks meant to distract your mind and sap your strength and cause you thus to lose the great war with yourself which is indeed an holy war, to win that war is to win undying glory, but victory in any other war is worse than rank defeat, and that is the horror of all men's wars, that the victor and the vanquished equally espouse defeat, would you have peace? Look not for it in wordy documents, nor strive to grave it even in rocks, for the pen that scribbles peace with ease, can scribble war with equal ease and the chisel that engraves let us have peace can easily engrave let us have war, and furthermore, the paper and the rock and the pen and the chisel are soon attacked by moth and rot and rust and all the alchemy of changing elements, not so the timeless heart of man which is the siege of holy understanding, once understanding is unveiled, then victory is won, and peace established in the heart forever and anon. An understanding heart is ever at peace even amid a war-dazed world, an ignorant heart is a dual heart, a dual heart makes for a dual world, a dual world breeds constant strife and war, whereas an understanding heart is a single heart, a single heart makes for a single world, a single world is a world at peace, for it takes two to make a war, therefore do I counsel you to war upon your heart so, as to make it single. The prize of victory is everlasting peace, when you can see, O prince, in any stone a throne, and find in any cave a castle, then too glad is the sun to be your throne, and the constellations to be your castles, when any daisy in the field is fit to serve you for a medal, and any worm to be for you a teacher, then joyful are the stars to pose upon your chest, and ready is the earth to be your pulpit, when you can rule your heart, what matters it to you who nominally rules your body? When all the universe is yours, what matters it who has dominion over this or that tract of the earth? Prince, your words are quite enticing. Yet does it appear to me that war is of nature a law, are not even the fishes of the sea in constant war? Is not the weak the prey of the strong? And I would not be anybody's prey, murdered. What appears to you as war is but a way of nature to feed and propagate herself, the strong is made food for the weak no less than is the weak made food for strong, yet who is strong, and who is weak in nature? Nature alone is strong, all else are but weaklings obeying nature's will, 
and meekly flowing down the streams of death, the deathless only may be classed as strong, and man is deathless, O oh Prince, I, mightier than nature is man, he eats into her fleshy heart, only to reach his fleshless heart, he prorogates himself only to raise himself beyond self-propagation, let men who would be justified of their unclean desires by the clean instincts of the beast, call themselves wild boars, or wolves, or jackals or what not, but let them not debase the noble name of man, believe murdered, O Prince, and be at peace, Prince, the senior tells me that murdered is well versed in the mysteries of witchcraft, and I would have him manifest some powers, that I may believe in him, murdered, if unveiling God and man be witchcraft, then is murdered a sorcerer, do you desire of my sorcery a proof and a manifestation? Behold, I am the proof and the manifestation, go to now, do the work, that you have come to do, Prince, well have you divined, that I have other work, to do than entertain my ears with your lunacies, for the Prince of Bether is a sorcerer of another sort, and anon he shall give a display of his art, to his men. Bring your chains and fetter up this God-man, or man-God, hands and feet, and let us show him, and the present company, what our sorcery is like, Naranda, like beasts of prey the four soldiers fell on the master, and quickly began to fasten chains above his hands and feet, for a moment the seven sat paralyzed, not knowing how to take, what was going on before them, whether in jest or in earnest, Mickey Inn and Zamora were quicker than the rest, in realizing the earnestness of the ugly situation, they sprang upon the soldiers like two infuriated lions, and would have laid them low were it, not for the restraining and reassuring voice of the master, murdered, let them ply their craft, impetuous Mikaean, let them have their way Zamora, no more appalling to murdered, are their chains than was the black pit, let Shamadam rejoice at patching his authority with that of the prince of Bether, the patch shall rend them both, Mikaean, how shall we stand aside, while our master is being chained like a criminal, murdered, have not the least anxiety for my sake, be at peace, so shall they do to you some day, but they shall harm themselves and not you, prince, so shall be done to every rogue, and charlatan who dares to flout established right and authority, this holy man, pointing to Shamanam, is the rightful head of this community, and his word must be low unto all, this sacred ark whose bounties you enjoy, is under my protection, my watchful eye surveys its destinies, my powerful arm is stretched over its roof and properties, my sword will clip the hand that would touch it with ill, let all know that and beware, again to his men, led this scoundrel out, his dangerous doctrine has well nigh ruined the ark, it would soon ruin our kingdom and the earth, if left to pursue its pernicious course, let him from now on preach it to the grim walls of the dungeon of Bether, hence with him, Naranda, the soldiers led the master out, the prince and Shamadam following with gleeful pride, the seven, walked behind this ominous procession, their eyes following the master, their lips glued with grief, their hearts bursting with tears, the master walked with a firm and certain step, and his head was lifted high, having walked a distance, he looked back at us and said, murdered, be steady and murdered, I shall not leave you till I launch my arm, and put you in command, Naranda, and long thereafter did these words of his ring loud in our ears to the accompaniment of the heavy clanking of the chains. Chapter 29. Shamadam vainly tries to win the companions over to himself murdered miraculously returns, and gives all companions, but Shamadam the kiss of faith. Naranda, winter was upon us abundant white and biting. Voiceless and breathless stood the snow-wrapped mountains. Only the valleys below showed patches of faded green with here and there a band of fluid silver meandering towards the sea. The seven were buffeted about by alternating waves of hope and doubt, Mickey and Mickister and Zamora inclined to the hope that the master would come back as he promised. Benun Himmel and Abimer clung to their doubt of his return. But all felt a dreadful emptiness and a vexing futility. The ark was cold, and grim, and inhospitable. 
A frosty silence hung upon its walls despite Shamadam's tireless efforts to give it life and warmth. For ever since Murdid was led away Shamadam sought to drown us with his kindliness. He offered us the best of food and wine, but the food did not sustain and the wine did not enliven. He burned much wood and coal, but the fire did not give warmth. He was most polite and seemingly affectionate, but his politeness and affections estranged us from him more and more. For long he made no mention of the master. At length he opened up his heart and said, Shamadam, you do me wrong, my companions, if you believe that I dislike murdered. Rather do I pity him with all my heart. Murdered may not be an evil man, but a dangerous visionary is he, and utterly impractical, and false is the doctrine he holds forth in a world of hard facts and practices. He and those who follow him are headed for a tragic end at their first encounter with harsh reality. Of that I am very certain. And I would save my companions from such a catastrophe. Murdid may have a clever tongue inspired by the rashness of youth, but his heart is blind and stubborn and ungodly. While I have the fear of the true God in my heart and the experience of years to give my judgment weight and authority, who could have managed the ark these many years to a better advantage than I, have I not lived without so long, and been to you at once a brother and a father? Have not our minds been blessed with peace, and our hands with exceeding plenty? Why let a stranger demolish what we have been so long building, and so distrust where trust was lord, and strife where peace was king? It is stark madness, my companions. To give up a bird in the hand for ten on the tree, Murdid would have you give up this ark which has sheltered you so long, and kept you near to God, and given you all that mortals can desire, and held you at a safe margin from the turmoil and anguish of the world. What does he promise you instead? Heartaches, and disappointments, and poverty with endless strife to boot, that and many worse things does he promise you. He promises an ark in the air, in the vast nothingness, a madman's dream, a childish fantasy, a sweet impossibility. Is he, perchance, wiser that Father Noah, the founder of the Mother Ark? It pains me overmuch to have you give his ravings any thought. I may have sinned against the Ark and its holy traditions when I appealed against murdered to the strong arm of my friend, the Prince of Bether. But I had your welfare at heart and that alone should justify my transgression. I wished to save you and the ark before it was too late. And God was with me, and I saved you. Rejoice with me, companions, and thank the Lord for sparing us the great ignominy of seeing the undoing of our ark with our sinful eyes. I for one could never outlive that shame. But now I dedicate myself anew to the service of God of Noah and his ark, and your service, my beloved companions. Be happy as of yore, that my happiness be complete in you." Naranda, Shamadam wept as he said that, and his tears were pitiful because too lonely, for they found them no company in any of our hearts and eyes. Of a certain morn, as the sun beamed out upon the mountains after a protracted siege of murky weather, Zamora took his harp and began to sing. Zamora, froze is the song on the frost-bitten lips of my harp, an ice-bound the dream in the ice-bound heart of my harp, where is the breath that shall thaw out your song, O oh my harp? Where is the hand that shall rescue the dream, O oh my harp? In the dungeon of Bether, mendicant wind, go and beg me a song of the chains, in the dungeon of Bether, sly rays of sun, go and filch me a dream from the chains of the dungeon of Bether, sky wide was spread of my eagle the wing, and beneath it I was king. Now but a waif and an orphan am I, and an owl rules my sky. For my eagle has flown to an area far, to the dungeon of Bether. Naranda, a tear dropped form Zamora's eyes as his hands fell limp, and his head drooped low over the harp, that tear gave vent to our pent-up sorrow, and opened up the sluices of our eyes. Mikayan jumped to his feet, and shouting with a voice I choke, he made for the door in the open air. Zamora Mikister and myself followed him through the court, 
and to the gate in the great outer enclosure beyond which companions were not allowed to venture, Mikian drew the heavy bolt with one forceful jerk, flung the gate open and dashed out as a tiger from his cage, the other three followed Mikian, the sun was warm and bright, and his rays refracted on the frozen snow, were almost blinding, treeless, snow-clad hills undulated before us so far as the eye could roam, and all seemed ablaze with fantastic hues of light, all about was a stillness so complete as to be ear annoying. Only the crunching snow beneath our feet broke the spell, the air though nipping, so caressed our lungs that we felt as if borne outward without any effort on our part. Even Mikian's mood was changed, and he stopped to exclaim, how good it is to be able to breathe, ah, just breathe. And truly it seemed that for the first time we felt the joy of breathing freely, and sensed the meaning of breath, we had walked a little way, when Mikister espied a dark object on a far-off eminence, some thought it a lonely wolf, some, a rock swept clean of snow by the wind, but the object seemed to move in our direction, and we decided to lay our course towards it, nearer and nearer it approached, assuming more and more a human shape, suddenly Mikian took a great leap forward, shouting as he leapt, it is he, it is he, and he it was, his graceful gait, his stately bearing, his nobly lifted head, the light-hearted wind played height and seek in his flowing garments and carelessly flirted his long, black locks. The sun had lightly tinged the delicate amber-brown of his face, but the dark and dreamy eyes scintillated, as before and sent forth waves of confidence, serenity and triumphant love. His tender feet, strapped in wooden sandals, were kissed bright rose by the frost, Mikian was the first to reach him, and he threw himself at his feet sobbing and laughing and mumbling as one in delirium, now is my soul restored unto me. The other three did likewise, but the master raised them one by one, embracing each with infinite tenderness and saying as he embraced them, murdered, receive the kiss of faith, henceforth you shall sleep in belief and raise in belief, and thou shall not nest in your pillow, nor paralyze your step with hesitation. Naranda, the four who remained in the ark, when they beheld the master at the door, thought him at first an apparition, and seer much affrighted, but when he hailed them each by his name, and they heard his voice, they precipitated themselves to his feet, except Shamatam who remained glued to his seat, the master did, and said to the three as he had done, and said to the four, Shamatam blankly looked on, and shook from head to feet, his face becoming deathly pale, his lips twitching, and his hands fumbling aimlessly at his belt, suddenly he slipped off his seat, and crawling on all fours to where the master stood, he put his arms around his feet, and said convulsively with his face to the floor, I too believe, the master raised him also, but without kissing him said, murdered, it is fear, that shakes Shamatam's mighty frame and his tongue to say, I too believe, Shamatam trembles and bows before the witchery, that brought murdered out of the black pit and the dungeon of Bether, and Shamatam fears retaliation, let his mind be at ease on that score, and let him turn his heart in the direction of true faith, a faith that is born upon a wave of fear is but the foam of fear, it rises and subsides with fear, true faith does not bloom save on the stalk of love, its fruit is understand, if you be afraid of God believe not in God, Shamatam, drawing back, with his eyes always to the floor, a wretch and an outcast is Shamatam in his own house, permit me, at least to be your servant for a day, and to bring you some meat and some warm clothing, for you must be very hungry and cold, murdered, I have meat unknown to kitchens, and warmth not borrowed from the thread of wool or the tongue of fire, would that Shamatam stored more of my meat and warmth, and less of other victuals and combustibles, behold, the sea is come to winter on the peaks, and the peaks are glad to don the frozen sea as a coat, and the peaks are warm in their coat, glad also is the sea, to lie for a space so still and so enchanted on the peaks, but for a space, for spring shall come, and the sea, like a hibernating serpent, shall uncoil itself and reclaim its temporarily mortgaged freedom, 
and again it shall race from shore to shore, and again it shall mount the air, and roam the sky, and spray itself wherever it shall list, but there be men like you, Shamatam, Shu's life is a constant winter and an unbroken hibernation, they are the ones who have received no omen yet of spring, behold, murdered is the omen, and omen of life is murdered, and not a death knell, how much longer would you hibernate? Believe, Shamatam that the life men live and the death they die, are but a hibernation, and I am come to stir men from their sleep, and call out of their dens, and holes unto the freedom of life undying, believe me for your sake, and not for mine, Naranda, Shamatam stood still, and opened not his mouth, Benun whispered to me to ask the master, of how he contrived to escape from the dungeon of Bether, but my tongue would not obey me to ask the question which, Hobbit, was quickly divined by the master, murdered, the dungeon of Bether is no longer a dungeon, it has become a shrine, the prince of Bether is no longer a prince, he is today a yearning pilgrim like you, even a gloomy dungeon, Benun, may be turned into a dazzling lighthouse, even a haughty prince may be swayed to lay aside his crown before the crown of truth, and even growling chains may be made to yield celestial music, nothing is a miracle to holy understanding which is the only miracle, Naranda, the master's words concerning the abdication of the prince of Bether fell like a stroke of lighting on, Shamatam, and to our consternation he was suddenly seized with a spasm so strange, and so violent, that we seriously feared for his life, the spasm ended in a swoon, and we labored long with him, before we finally brought him to. Chapter 30. Mikian's Dream Revealed by the Master. Naranda, for a long stretch before and after the master's return from Bether Mikian, was observed to behave as one in trouble. He kept aloof most of the time, speaking little, eating little, and rarely leaving his cell, his secret he would not confide even to me, and we all marveled that the master would say or do nothing to assuage his pain, although the loved him very strongly, one, as Mickey and with the rest, were warming themselves round the brazier, the master began to discourse on the great nostalgia, murdered, a certain man once had a dream, and this is the dream he had, he saw himself upon the green bank of a broad, deep and noiselessly flowing river, the bank was alive with great multitudes of men women and children of every age and tongue, and all had wheels of various sizes and tints, which they rolled, up and down the bank, and the multitudes were dressed in festive colors, and were out to frolic and to feast, and their hubbub filled the air, like a restless sea did they heave up and down, back and forth, he alone was not dressed for the feast, for he was aware of no feast, and he alone had no wheel to roll, and hard as he strained his ear, he could not catch a single word from the polyglot crowd that was akin to his own dialect, and hard as he strained his eye, it could not rest upon a single face, that was to it familiar, and furthermore, the crowd as it surged about him, cast meaningful glances in his direction, as if to say, who is this comical being? Then it dawned in upon him, that the feast was not his, and that he was a total stranger, and he felt a pang in his heart, anon he heard a great roar coming from the upper end of the bank, and forthwith he saw the multitudes fall to their knees, cover their eyes with their hands, and bend their heads to the ground, breaking as they fell in two rows and leaving between an open, straight and narrow aisle all the length of the bank, he alone remained standing in the middle of the aisle not knowing, what to do and which way to turn, as he looked up to whence the roar was coming, he beheld an enormous bull spitting tongues of flame from his mouth, and blowing columns of smoke from his nostrils, and dashing down the aisle at a lightning speed, in terror he looked at the furious beast, and sought escape right and left, but could find none, he felt as if transfixed to the ground, and was certain of his doom, just as the bull approached to where he felt the scorching flame and smoke, the man was lifted in the air, the bull stood beneath him shooting more fire and smoke upward, but the man rose higher and higher, and though he felt the fire and the smoke, yet did he gain a certain confidence, 
that the bull could no longer do him any harm, and he set his course across the river, looking down upon the green bank he saw the crowd still kneeling as before, and the bull shooting arrows at him instead of smoke and fire. He could hear the arrows hiss as they passed beneath him, some of them pierced his garments, but none did touch his flesh. At last the bull, the crowd and the river were out of sight, and the man flew on. He flew over a dreary, sun-scorched land without any trace of life whatsoever. At length he alighted at the foot of a high, rugged mountain desolate, not only of a blade of grass, but even of a lizard and an ant, and he felt as though his only road lay up the mountain. Long did he look for a safe way up, but all he could see was a barely traceable trail such as goats only can walk. That trail he decided to follow, scarce had he risen a few hundred feet when he saw, not far to his left, a broad and a smooth roadbed. As he stopped and was about to leave his trail, the roadbed became a human stream, one half of it laboringly ascending, the other rushing headlong down the mountain. Men and women in tea untold numbers struggled up and rolled down, head over heels, and sent forth as they rolled down such moans and groans as to strike terror in the heart. The man observed this weird phenomenon for a while and decided in his mind that somewhere up the mountain was an immense madhouse and that those rolling down were some of its escaped inmates, and he continued on his winding trail, falling here and rising there, but always winding higher and higher. At a certain height the human stream dried up and its bed become entirely effaced. Again the man was alone with the somber mountain, and no hand to point the way, and no voice to bolster up. His waning courage and steel his rapidly failing strength, accepting a vague belief that his course lay upwards the summits, on and on he plodded tracing his path with his blood. After much soul-rendering toil he arrived at a spot where the earth was soft and stoneless. To his indescribable delight he saw some delicate tufts of grass sprouting here and young, and the grass was so tender, and the soil so velvety, and the air so aromatic, and so lulling, that he felt as one robbed of the last ounce of strength, so he relaxed and fell asleep, he was awakened by a hand touching his hand, and a voice saying to him, Arise! The summit is in sight, and spring awaits you on the summit. The hand and the voice were those of a most bodious maiden, a paradise being, dressed in a robe of dazzling whiteness. She gently took the man by the hand, and the man arose invigorated and refreshed, and the man did glimpse the summit, and the man did smell the spring, but just as he raised his foot to take the first step forward he awoke from his dream. What would Mikayan do? Were he to awaken from such a dream, and find him stretched upon a common bed, hemmed in within four common walls, but with the vision of that maiden glowing behind his eyelids, and the fragrant effulgence of that summit fresh in his heart, Mikayan, as if stung, but I am that dreamer, and mine is that dream, mine also is the vision of that maiden and the summit, it haunts me till this day, and gives me no repose, it made me a stranger to myself, because of it Mikayan no longer knows Mikayan, yet I dreamed that dream soon after you were led away to Bether, how come you related in such minute details? What manner of man are you, that even dreams of men are to you an open book? Ah, the freedom of that summit! Ah, the beauty of that maiden! How trite is all else in comparison, my very soul has deserted me for their sake, and only on that day, when I saw you coming from Bether, did my soul rejoin me, and I felt calm and strong, but the feeling has left me since, and again am I drawn away from myself by the threads invisible, save me, O oh my great companion, I languish away for a vision, murdered, you know not what you ask, Mikayan, would you be saved from your savior? Mikayan, I would be spared this unendurable torture of being so homeless in a world so snug at home, I would be on the summit with the maiden, murdered, rejoice because your heart has been seized with the great nostalgia, for that is a promise irrevocable, that you shall find your country and your home, and be upon the summit with the maiden, a bimer, pray, tell us more of this nostalgia, by what symptoms may we recognize it. 
Chapter 31. The Great Nostalgia. Murdered, like mist is the great nostalgia, emitted by the heart, it shuts away the heart, as mist effused by sea and land, obliterates both land and sea, and also as the mist bereaves the eye of visible reality making itself the sole reality, so this nostalgia subdues the feelings of the heart, and makes itself the feeling paramount, and seemingly so formless, and aimless and blind as the mist, yet like the mist it teems with the forms unborn, is clear of sight and very definite of purpose, like fever also is the great nostalgia, as fever, ignited in the body, saps the vitality of the body, while burning up its poisons, so this nostalgia born of the friction in the heart, debilitates the heart as it consume away its dross and every superfluity, and like a thief is the great nostalgia, for as a sneaking thief relieves his victim of a burden, yet leaves him sore embittered, so this nostalgia by stealth lifts all the burdens of the heart, yet leaves it most disconsolate, and burdened by its very lack of burdens, broad as the bank and green where men and women dance away, and sing away, and toil and weep away their evanescent days, but fearsome is the fire and smoke belching bull that hobbles up their feet, and brings them to their knees, and stuffs back their songs into their vocal cords, and glues their swollen eyelids with their tears, broad also and deep is the stream, that separates them from the other bank, and neither can they swim it, nor can they row across it with an oar, nor sail it with a sail, few, very few, of them venture to span it with a thought, but all, almost all, are eager to adhere to their bank, where each goes on rolling his pet wheel of time, the man with the great nostalgia, has no pet wheel to roll, amid a world so tensely occupied and pressed for time he is alone without an occupation and unhurried, in humanity so decorous in dress, and speech and manner he finds himself naked, stuttering and awkward, he cannot laugh with the laughing, nor can he with the weeping weep, men eat and drink, and have pleasure in eating and drinking, he eats without a relish, and his drink is vapid in his mount, others are mated, or busy seeking mates. He walks alone, and sleeps alone, and dreams his dreams alone, others are rich in worldly wit and wisdom. He alone is dull and unwise, others have cozy corners which they call homes. He alone is homeless, others have certain spots of the earth which they call native land, and whose glory they sing very loud. He alone has no spot to sing, and to call his native land, for his heart's eye is towards the other bank, a sleepwalker is the man with the great nostalgia amid a world apparently so wide awake, he is drawn by a dream which those about him neither see nor feel, therefore they shrug their shoulders and titter in their sleeves, but when the god of fear, the fire and smoke belching bull, appears on the scene, then are they made to bite the dust, while the sleepwalker at those they shrugged their shoulders and tittered in their sleeves, is lifted on the wings of faith above them and their bull, and carried far over the other bank, and to the foot of the rugged mountain, barren, and bleak and forlorn is the land over which the somnambulist flies, but the wings of faith are strong, and the man flies on, somber, and bald and blood curdling the mountain at whose foot he descends, but the heart of faith is indomitable, and the man's heart boldly beats on, rocky and slippery and barely discernible his trail up the mountain, but silken is the hand, and steady is the foot, and keen is the eye of faith, and the man climbs on, he meets on the way with men, and women laboring up the mountain along a broad and smooth roadbed, they are the men and women of the small nostalgia who crave to reach the summit, but with a lame and a sightless guide, for their guide is their belief in what the eye can see, and what the ear can hear, and what the hand can feel, and what the nose and tongue can smell and taste, some of them rise no higher than the mountain's ankles, some reach its knees, and dome the hips, and very few the girdle, but all slip back with their guide, and go tumbling down the mountain without, so much as glimpsing the fair summit, can the eye see all to be seen, and the ear hear all to be heard, can the hand feel all to be felt, and the nose smell all to be smelled? Or can the tongue taste all to be tasted?
Only when faith, born of divine imagination, comes to their aid will the senses truly sense, and thus become ladders to the summit. Senses devoid of faith are most undependable guides, though their road appear to be smooth and broad, yet is it full of hidden traps and pitfalls. And those who take it to the summit of freedom either perish on the way, or slip and tumble back to the base from which they made their start, and there they nurse many a broken bone, and there they stitch many a gapping wound, the men with the small nostalgia are they who, having built a world with their senses, soon find it small and stuffy, and so they long for a larger and airier home, but instead of seeking new materials and a new master builder, they rummage up the old materials and call upon the same architect, the senses, to design and build for them a larger home, no sooner is the new one built than they find it so small, and so stuffy is the old, and so they go on demolishing and building, and never can they build the home that gives them the comfort and the freedom they carve, for they rely upon their deceivers to save them from deceit, and like the fish that jumps from the frying pan into the fire, they run away from a small mirage, only to be lured by a bigger one, between the men of the great and the men of the small nostalgia, are the vast herds of rabbit men who feel no nostalgia at all, they are content to dig their holes and live and breed and die therein. And they find their holes quite elegant, and roomy and warm, and would not exchange them for the splendor of a kingly palace, and they snicker of all somnambulists, especially the ones who walk a solitary trail whose footprints are few and very hard to trace, much like an eagle hatched by a backyard hen and cooped up with tea brood of that hen is the man with the great nostalgia among his fellow men. His brother chicks and mother hen would have the young eagle as one of them, possessed of their nature and habits, and living as they live, and he would have them like himself, dreamers of the freer air and skies illimitable, but soon he finds him a stranger and a pariah among them, and he is pecked by all, even his mother, but the call of the summits is loud in his blood and the stench of the coop exasperating to his nose, yet does he suffer it all in silence till he is fully fledged, and then he mounts the air, and casts a loving farewell look upon his erstwhile brothers, and their mother who merrily cackle on as they dig in the earth for more seed and worms, rejoice Mikayan, yours is a prophet's dream, the great nostalgia has made your world too small, and made you a stranger in that world, it has unloosed your imagination from the grip of the despotic senses, and imagination has brought you forth your faith, and faith shall lift you high above the stagnant, stifling world and carry you across the dreary emptiness, and up the rugged mountains, where every faith must needs, be tried and purified of the last dregs of doubt, and faith so purified, and triumphant shall lead you to the boundaries of the eternally green summit, and there deliver you into the hands of understanding, having discharged its task. Faith shall retire, and understanding shall guide your steps to the unutterable freedom of the summit which is the true, the boundless and all-including home of God and the overcoming man. Stand well to the test Mikayan, stand well, you all, to stand but for a moment on that summit is worth enduring every kind of pain, but to abide forever on that summit is worth eternity, Himmel, would you not lift us now to your summit, though for a glimpse, however brief, murdered, be not in haste, Himmel and bide your time, where I breathe freely, there you gasp for breath, where I walk lightly, there you pant and stumble, keep you hold on faith, and faith shall perform the gigantic feat, so taught I Noah, so I teach you. Chapter 32 on sin and the shedding of the fig leaf aprons. Murdered, you have been told of sin, and you would know how man become a sinner. And you declare, and not without a merit, that if man, the image and likeness of God, be a sinner then God himself must be the source of sin. Therein is a snare for the unsuspecting, and I would not have you, my companions ensnared. Therefore would I remove this snare from your path, that you may remove it from the paths of men. There is no sin in God, unless it be sin for the sun, to give of his light to a candle. Nor is there sin in man, 
unless it be sin for a candle, to burn itself away in the sun, and thus be joined into the sun. But there is sin in the candle, that would not give forth its light, and when a math is applied to its wick, it curses the match and the hand that applied it. There is sin in the candle, that is ashamed of burning in the sun, therefore would screen itself away from the sun. Man did not sin by disobeying the law, rather by covering his ignorance of law. I, there is sin in the fig leaf apron. Have you not read the story of the fall of man, so frugal and naive of word, but so sublime and so subtle of meaning? Have you not read how man, when fresh from the bosom of God, was like an infant God, passive and erd uncreative? For though endowed with all the attributes of Godhood yet, like all infants was he incapable of knowing, much less of exercising, his infinite capacities and talents. Like a lonely seed enclosed in a bodious vial was man in the Garden of Eden. A seed in a vial will remain a seed, and never will the marvel sealed up within its skin, be stirred to life and light save it be hid in a soil congenial to its nature, and the skin thereof be broken. But man had no soil of his nature to plant himself therein, and to sprout forth. His was a face nowhere reflected in a kindred face. His was a human ear which heard no human voice. His was a human voice which echoed back from no human throat. His was a heart which beat a lonely unison. Alone, so utterly alone, was man amid a world well paired and launched upon its course. He was a stranger to himself, and had no labor of his own, and no set course to follow. Eden to him was what a comfortable crib is to a babe, a state of passive bliss, a well-appointed incubator. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life were both within his reach, yet would he stretch no hand to pluck and taste of their fruit, for his taste and his will, his thoughts and his desires, and even his very self were all wrapped up within him, and awaiting to be slowly unwrapped. He by himself could not do the unwrapping. Therefore was he made to yield out of himself a helpmeet for himself, a hand that would help him unwind his many wrappings. Where else could his help be got save from his own, being so rich with help, because so potent with divinity? And that is most significant. Not a new dust and breath is Eve, but the very dust and breath of Adam, a bone of his bone and a flesh of his flesh. Not another creature appears on the scene, but the self-same single Adam is made a twain, a he Adam and a she Adam. Thus the solitary, unmirrored face acquires a companion and a mirror, and the name unechoed in any human voice begins to reverberate in sweet refrains up and down the alleys of Eden, and the heart whose lonely beats were muffled in a lonely breast begins to feel its pulse and to hear its beats in a companion heart within a companion breast. Thus the sparkle steel encounters the flint which brings forth its sparks in abundance. Thus the unlit candle is set alight from both ends. One is the candle, one is the wick and one is the light, though issuing from seemingly opposite ends. And thus the seed in the vial finds the soil, where it can germinate and unfold its mysteries. So does unity unconscious of itself beget duality, that through the friction and the opposition of duality, it may be made to understand its unity. In that also is man the faithful image and the likeness of his God. For God, the primal consciousness, projects of himself the word, and both word and consciousness are unified in holy understanding. Not a punishment is duality, but a process inherent in the nature of unity and necessary for the unfolding of its divinity. How childish to think otherwise! How childish to believe that so stupendous a process can be made to run its course in three score years and ten, or even in three score millions years! Is it so small a matter to become a god? Long is the course of duality, and foolish are they who would measure it with calendars. Eternity counts not the revolutions of that stars. What was the first act of Adam made dual? It was to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and thus to make his whole world as dual as himself. 
No longer were things what they were, innocent and indifferent. But they became two opposite camps, whereas before they were one. And the serpent, that beguiled Eve to taste of good and evil, was he not the deeper voice of active, yet inexperienced, duality urging itself to act and to experience? The Eve was the first to hear that voice, and to obey it is no wonder at all. For Eve was the whetstone, as it were, the instrument designed to bring out the powers latent in her mate. Have you not often stopped to visualize this first woman in his first human story stealing her way among the trees of Eden, her nerves on edge her heart a flutter like a cage, her eyes searching everywhere for possible detection, her mouth watering as her trembling hand reached out for the tempting fruit? Have you not held your breath as she plucked the fruit and sunk her teeth into its tender meat to taste a momentary sweetness? which was to turn to everlasting bitterness for herself and all her progeny. Have you not wished with all your hearts that God would forestall Eve's insane audacity by appearing to her just as she was about to commit a reckless deed, and not afterward as he does in the story? And having committed her deed, have you not wished that Adam would possess the wisdom and the courage to abstain from being her accomplice? Yet neither did God intervene, nor Adam abstains. For God would not have his likeness unlike him. It was his will and plan that man should walk the long way of duality in order to unfold his own will and plan and unify himself by understanding. As to Adam he could not, even if he wished refrain from partaking of the fruit tendered him by his wife. It was incumbent on him to eat of it simply because his wife had eaten of it and the two were one flesh and each was accountable for the other's act. W.S. God indignant and wroth, because man ate of the fruit of good and evil? God forbid. For he knew that man could not but eat, and he wished him to eat, but he wished him also to know beforehand the consequence of eating, and to have the stamina to face that consequence. And man had the stamina. And man did eat. And man faced the consequence and the consequence was death. For man in becoming actively dual through the will of God had forthwith died to passive unity. Therefore is death no penalty, but a phase of life inherent in duality. For the nature of duality is to make all things dual and to beget for everything a shadow. So Adam begot his shadow in Eve, and both begot for their life a shadow called death. But Adam and Eve, though shadowed by death, continue to have shadow less life in the life of God. A constant friction is duality, and the friction gives the illusion of two opposing sides bent upon self-extermination. In truth the seeming opposites are self-completing, self-fulfilling and working hand in hand to one and the same end, the perfect peace and unity and balance of holy understanding. But the illusion is rooted in the senses, and it persists, so long as the senses persist. Therefore did Adam answer God, when he called him after his eyes were opened, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Also, the woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. No other was Eve, but Adam's very bone and very flesh. Yet consider this newborn eye of Adam which, after its eyes were opened, began to see itself as something different, apart and independent of Eve, of God and of all God's creation. An illusion was this eye. An illusion of the newly opened eye was this personality detached from God. It had nor substance, nor reality. It was born that through its death man might come to know his real self which is the self of God. It shall vanish away, when the outer eye is darkened, and the inner eye is illuminated. And though it baffled Adam, yet did it strongly intrigue his mind and lure his imagination. To have a self which one can call entirely one's own, that is indeed too flattering and too tempting to man who had no consciousness of any self. And Adam was tempted and flattered by his illusory self. And though he was ashamed of it because too unreal, or too naked yet would he not part therewith. Instead he clung to it with all his heart and all his newborn ingenuity. 
and he sewed fig leaves together and made him an apron wherewith to cover up his naked personality and keep it to himself away from the all-penetrating eye of God. So Eden, the state of blissful innocence, the unity unconscious of itself, fell away from the dual fig leaf aproned man, and swords of flame were put between him and the tree of life. Man walked out of Eden through the twin gate of good and evil, he shall walk in through the single gate of understanding. He made his exit with his back to the tree of life, he shall re-enter with his face to that tree. He set out on his long and trying journey ashamed of his nakedness and careful to hid his shame, he shall reach his journey's end with his purity unaproned and with his heart proud of his nudity. But that shall not come to pass till man by sin be delivered from sin. For sin shall prove its own undoing. And where is sin, but in the fig leaf apron? Aye, nothing else is sin, but the barrier that man set up between himself and God, between his transient self and his abiding self. At first but a handful of fig leaves, that barrier has come to be a mighty bulwark. For ever since he shed away the innocence of Eden man, has been very hard at work amassing more, and o'er fig leaves and sewing aprons upon aprons. The slothful are content to go on patching up the rents in their aprons with shreds discarded by their more industrious neighbors. And every patch in the garment of sin is sin, for it tends to perpetuate that shame which was man's first and very poignant feeling upon his detachment from God. Is man doing aught to overcome his shame? Alas! All his labors are shame heaped up on shame, and aprons upon aprons. What are man's arts and learnings but fig leaves? His empires, nations, racial segregations and religions on the war path, are they not cults of fig leaf worship? His codes of right and wrong, of honor and dishonor, of justice and injustice, his countless social creeds and conventions, are they not fig leaf aprons? His valuing the invaluable and measuring the immeasurable and standardizing what is beyond any standard is not all that patching the overpatched loincloth? His gluttony for pleasure that are rife with pain, his greed for riches that impoverish, his thirst for mastery that subjugates and lust for grandeur that belittles are not all these so many fig leaf aprons? In his pathetic rush to cover up his nakedness man has put on too many aprons which in the course of years have struck so tightly to his skin that he no longer distinguishes between them and his skin. And man gasps for breath, and man appeals for relief from his many skins. Yet, in his delirium man would do all things to be relieved of his burden except that only thing that can in truth relieve him of his burden, and that is to throw off that burden, he would be rid of his extra skins while clinging to them with all his might. He would be denuded and yet remain fully dressed. The time of denuding is at hand. And I am come to help you shed away your extra skins, your fig leaf aprons that you may help all yearners in the world to shed away theirs, too. I only point the way, but each shall do his shedding by himself however painful be the undertaking. Wait not on any miracle to save you from yourself, nor be afraid of pain, for naked understanding shall turn your pain into an everlasting ecstasy of joy. Should you then face yourself in the nakedness of understanding, and should God call to you and ask, where are you, you would not feel ashamed, nor would you be afraid, nor would you hide away from God. But rather would you stand unshaken, unbound, and divinely serene, and answer back to God, Behold us, God, our soul, our being, our only self. In shame and fear and pain have we walked the long and rough and tortuous path of good and evil which you have appointed us at the dawn of time. The great nostalgia urged our feet, and faith sustained our hearts and now has understanding lifted our burdens, bound up our wounds, and brought us back into your holy presence naked of good and evil, life and death, naked of all illusions of duality, naked of every self except your all-embracing self. With no fig leaves, to hide our nakedness we stand before you unashamed illuminated unafraid. Behold, 
we are united. Behold, we have overcome. And God shall embrace you with infinite love, and straightway shall lead you unto his tree of life. So taught I Noah. So I teach you. Naranda, this also was said by the master around the brazier. Chapter 33. On night, the peerless singer. Naranda, as longs an exile for his hearth so longed we all for the airy which icy winds, and heavy snowdrifts had rendered inaccessible the winter long, the master chose a night of spring whose eyes were soft and bright, whose breath was warm and aromatic, whose heart was quick and wide awake in which to lead us to the airy, the eight flat stones which served us for seats were still arranged in the self-same semicircle as when we left them on the day the master was led to Bether. It was evident that none had visited the airy since that day. Each of us took his usual seat and waited on the master to speak, but he would not open his mouth. Even the full moon looking in upon us, as if to bid us welcome, seemed to hang in suspense upon the master's lips. Mountain cataracts, tumbling from crag to crag, filled the night with their boisterous melodies, occasionally the hooting of an owl, or the broken notes of a cricket's song would fill their way into our ears, long did we wait in breathless silence before the master raised his head, and opening his half-shut eyes began to speak to us in this wise, murdered, in the stillness of this night murdered would have you hear the songs of night, give ear unto the choir of night, for verily is night a peerless singer, out of the darkest crannies of the past, out of the brightest castles of the future, from the pinnacles of heavens and the bowels of the earth night's voice gush and rush unto the farthest corners of the universe, in mighty waves they roll, and eddy round your ears, unburden well your ears, that you may hear them well, what bustling day nonchalantly blots out, unhurried night restores with passing wizardry, do not the moon and the stars hide in the glare of day? What day drowns out in hodgepodge make believe? Night chants a broad and measured ecstasy. Even the dreams of herbs swell up the choir of night. Lend your ears to the spheres as they swing through the skies. Hear them sing lullabies to the giant babe of slumber in the cradle of quick sands, to the king in pauper's tatters, to the lightning held in fetters, to the god in swaddling bands. Hear the earth at once in travail, sucking, rearing, marrying, burying, in the forest wild beasts prowling, growling, howling, tearing, torn, birds rehearsing in their dreams, tales of meadows, songs and streams, trees and shrubs and every breath, quaffing life in cups of death, from the summit and the vale, from the desert and the sea, from the air, and from beneath the sod, rolls out the challenge to the time-veiled God. Hear the mothers of the world, how they weep, how they wail, and the fathers of the world how they moan, how they groan. Hear their sons and daughters run, to the gun, and from the gun, scolding God and cursing fate, feigning love and breathing hate, drinking zeal and sweating fears, sowing smiles and reaping tears, wetting with their crimson blood, the fury of the gathering flood, hear their famished bull eyes shrink, and their swollen eyelids blink, and their withered fingers grope, for the carcass of their hope. Hear the fiendish engine rumble, and the haughty cities tumble, and the mighty citadels peel away their own death knells, and the monuments of yore splash in pools of mud and gore. Hear the prayers of the just chime along with shrieks of lust, and the infant's artless prattle wraps our eyes with wicked tattle, and the maiden's blushing smile warble with the harlot's guile, and the rapture of the brave, hum the broodings of the knave. In very tent, and hut of every tribe and clan, night trumpets forth the battle hymn of man. But night the sorceress blends well the lullabies, the challenges, the battle hymns and all, into a song too subtle for the ear, a song so grand, so infinite in sweep, so deep of tone, so mellow of refrain, that even angles choirs and symphonies are noise, and babble in comparison, that is the overcomer's trump song, the mountains drowsing in the lap of night, the reminiscent deserts with their dunes, the deep somnambulant, the roving stars, the dwellers in the cities of the dead, the holy triad and the omniwill, 
hail and acclaim the overcoming man. Happy are they who hear and understand. Happy are they who, when alone with night, feel calm and deep, and broad as night, whose faces are not smitten in the dark by wrongs they perpetrated in the dark, whose eyelids do not smart with tears they caused their fellow men to shed, whose hands do not itch with mischief and with greed, whose ears are not besieged with hissings of their lust, whose thoughts are not bitten with their thoughts, whose hearts are not hives for all manners of cares that swarm without an end from every nook of time, whose fears burrow no tunnels in their brains, who can say boldly unto night, reveal us unto day, and say to day, reveal us unto night, I thrice happy are they who when alone with night, feel so well turned, so still so infinite at night, to the Malone night sings the overcomer's song. If you would face the calumny of day with heads afloat and eyes alight with faith, hasten to win the friendliness of night, be friends with night, wash thoroughly your hearts in your own life blood, and place them in her heart, entrust your naked yearnings to her bosom, and immolate ambitions at her feet, save the ambition to be free through holy understanding, then shall you be invulnerable to all the shafts of day, and night shall bear you witness before men, that you in truth are overcomers. Though feverish days toss you hither and yon, and starless nights enfold you in their gloom, and you be cast upon the world's crossroads, with no footprints or signs to show the way, yet would you fear no man or circumstance, and would you have no shadow of a doubt that days and nights, as well as men and things, would seek you soon or late and meekly beg you to command them, for you have gained the confidence of night, and he who gains the confidence of night can easily command the coming day. Give ear unto the heart of night, for in its bears the overcomer's heart, if I had tears I'd offer them tonight to every twinkling star and speck of dust, to every gurgling brook and singing catadid, to every violet wafting on the air its fragrant trial, to every racing wind, to every mountain vale, to every tree and every blade of grass, to all the passing peace and beauty of night, I'd pour my tears before them as apologies for men's ingratitude and savage ignorance, for men. The conscripts of the heinous penny are busy in the services of their lord, too busy to give heed to any voice, and will accept his voice and will, and dreadful is the business of men's lord, it is to turn their world into a slaughterhouse wherein they are all butchered and butchered, and so inebriate with gore. Men slaughter men in the belief that he who slaughters more falls heir to all the shares of those he slaughtered and all the bounties of the earth and the munificence of the skies, unhappy duke. When did a world ever become a lamb by tearing up another wolf? When did a snake ever become a dove by crushing and devouring fellow snakes? When did a man, by killing other men, inherit but their joys without their sorrows? When did an ear, by plugging other ear become better attuned to harmonies of life, or did an eye, by plucking other eyes become more sensitive to beauty's emanations? Is there a man or any host of men who can exhaust the blessings of a single hour, whether he of bread and wine, whether of light and peace? The earth does not give birth to more than she can feed, the skies solicit not, nor steal subsistence for their young, they lie who say to men, if you would have your fill, kill and inherit those you kill, how shall he prosper on the tears and blood, and agonies of men who failed to prosper on their love, and on the milk and honey of the earth, and on the deep affections of the skies? They lie who say to men, each nation for itself, how could a centipede ever advance an inch, if each leg were to move in contrary direction to others, or block the progress of the others or plot destruction for the others, is not mankind a monster centipede whose man legs are nations? They lie who say to men, to rule is honor, to be ruled, is shame is not a donkey driver led by his donkey's tail? Is not a jailer bound unto the jailed? Verily the donkey drives his leader, the jailbird jails his jailer, they lie who say to men, the race is to the swift, and right is to the mighty, for life is not a race of muscle and of brawn, the cripple and the maimed too often reach the goal much quicker than the whole, 
And even an at sometimes lays low on gladiator, they lie who say to men that wrong cannot be righted save with wrong, a wrong superimposed upon another wrong will never make a right, let wrong alone, and it will work its own undoing, but men are gullible of all their lord's philosophy, the penny in his cormorants they piously believe, and faithfully fulfill their wildest vagaries, while night that sings and preaches of deliverance, and even God himself, they neither trust nor heed, and you, companions, shall they brand either as lunatics or as impostors, take no offense at men's ingratitude and stinging mockery, but labor with a love and patience inexhaustible for their deliverance from themselves, and from the flood of fire and blood, that shall be soon upon them, it is time men stop the butchering of men, the sun and moon and stars are since eternity awaiting to be seen and heard and understood, the alphabet of earth, to be deciphered, the highways of space, to be traveled, and raveled thread of time, to be unraveled, the fragrance of the universe, to be inhaled, the catacombs of pain, to be demolished, the den of death, to be ransacked, the bread of understanding, to be tasted, and man, the gotten veils to be unveiled, it is time men stopped the pillaging of men, and unified their ranks, to carry on the common task, enormous is the task, but sweet the victory, all else is trite, and empty in comparison, yea, it is time, but few only shall heed, the others must await another call, another dawn. Chapter 34. On the Mother of them. Murdered, in the stillness of this night, murdered would have you meditate upon the Mother of them. Space and all therein is an of them whose shell is time. That is the Mother of them. Enveloping this of them, as air envelops the earth is God evolved, the macro God life unembodied, infinite and ineffable. Enveloped in this of them is God involved, the micro God life embodied, and likewise infinite and ineffable. Though measureless as human measures go, yet has the mother of them borns. While not infinite itself it borders on infinity on every side. All things and beings in the universe are nothing more than space-time over enclosing the same micro-god, but in varying stages of unfolding. The micro-god in man has a greater space-time expansion than the micro-god in the animal, and that in the animal a greater expansion than that in the plant, and so on down the scale of creation. The countless over-representing all things and beings, visible and invisible are so arranged within the mother of them, that the larger in expansion, contains the immediate smaller, with spaces intervening down to the smallest of them which is the central nucleus enclosed in space and time infinitesimal. An of them within an of them, within an of them defying human numbers, and all God fertilized, that is the universe, my companions. Yet do I feel my words too slippery for your minds, and fain would make them safe and steady rungs, were any words ever made safe, and steady rungs in the latter, that leads to perfect understanding. Hang on to more than words, and by more than your minds, if you would reach the height and depths and breadths murdered would have your reach. Words at best, are flashes that reveal horizons, they are not the way to those horizons, still less are they those horizons. So when I speak to you of the Ava Mandova, and the macro god and micro god, hang not unto the letter, but follow the flash. And you shall find my words as mighty wings to your faltering understanding. Consider nature all about you. Do you not find it built upon the Avam principle? Yea, in the Avam you shall find the key to all creation. An Avam is your head, your heart, your eye. An Avam is every fruit and every seed thereof. An Avam is a drop of water and every sperm of every living creature and the countless orbs tracing their mystic charts up to the face of heavens, are they not all over containing the quintessence of life, the micro-god, in varying stages of unfolding? Is not all life constantly hatching out of an ovum, and going back into an ovum? Miraculous, indeed, and continuous it, he process of creation. The flow of life from the surface of the mother ovum into the center thereof, and from the center unto the surface goes on uninterrupted. 
As he expands in time and space the micro god in the central nucleus passes from ovum to ovum, from the lowest to the highest order of life, the lowest being the least and the highest the most expanded in time and space, and the time required for passage from one of them into another varying from a twinkle in some cases to an eons in others. And so the process goes on until the shell of the mother of them is pierced, and the micro-god emerges as macro-god. Thus is life an unfolding, a growth and a progress, but not as men are wont to peak of growth and progress. For growth to them is an accretion in bulk, and progress a going forward. Whereas growth is an all-around expansions in time and space and progress is s motion extending equally in all directions, backward as well as forward, and downward and sideward as well as upward. The ultimate growth, therefore, is the outgrowing of space, and the ultimate progress is the outstripping of time thus merging into macro god and reaching his freedom from bounds of time and space, which is the only freedom worth the name. And that is the destiny set for man. Ponder well these words, O oh monks. Accept your very blood imbibes them with a relish, your efforts to free yourselves and others are apt to add more links to your chains and theirs. Murdered would have you understand that you may help all yearners to understand. Murdered would have you free that you may lead to freedom the race to those who long to overcome and to be free. Therefore would he elucidate still further the Savam principle, particularly in so far as it touches man. All orders of being below man are enclosed in group ova. Thus there are for plants as many ova as there are varieties of plants, the more evolved enclosing all the less evolved. And so it is with insects, fishes and mammals, always the more evolved enclosing all the orders of life below it down to the central nucleus. As the yolk and white within the common egg serve to feed and evolve the embryo chick therein, so do all the ova enclosed in any of them serve to feed and unfold the micro-god therein. In such successive of them the micro-god finds space-time food slightly different from that furnished him in the preceding of them. Hence the difference in space time expansion. Diffused and formless in the gas, he comes more concentrated and approaches form in the liquid, while in the mineral he assumes a definite form and fixity remaining all the while devoid of any attributes of life as manifested in the higher forms. In the vegetable he takes on form with the capacity to grow, to multiply and to feel. In the animal he feels and moves and propagates, has memory and rudiments of though. But in man, in addition to all that, he acquires a personality and the ability to contemplate, to express himself and to create. To be sure, men's creation is comparison to God's, is like a house of cards built by an infant compared to a glorious temple, or a graceful castle built by a super architect. Yet it is a creation nonetheless. Each man becomes an individual of them the more evolved enclosing the less evolved plus all the animal vegetable and the lower ova down to the central nucleus. While the most evolved, the overcomer, encloses all the human and the less than human ova. The size of the ovum enclosing any man is measured by the breadth of the space-time horizons of that man. While one man's consciousness of time embraces no more than the brief span from his infancy to the present hour, and his space horizons encompass no more than his eye can reach, and others' horizons encompass pasts immemorial and futures far in the distance, and leagues of spaces yet untraversed by his eye. The food provided to all men for their unfolding is that same, but their capacity of feeding and digesting is not the same, for they have not hatched out of the same of them at the same time and place. Hence the difference in their space-time expansion, and hence no two can be found who are exactly alike. From the same board, so richly and so lavishly spread before all men, one feasts on the purity and beauty of gold and is filled, while another feasts upon the gold itself and is ever hungry. A hunter looking at a row is prompted to kill it and consume it. A poet looking at the same row is carried as on wings into spaces and times of which the hunter never dreams. 
Mickey and living in the same arc with Shamanam, dreams of ultimate freedom and the summit of release from the bounds of time and space, while Shamanam is ever busy bobbling himself with longer and sturdier hawsers of space and time. Barely Mikayan and Shamadam, though touching elbows, are far apart. Mikayan contains Shamadam, but Shamadam contains not Mikayan. Therefore, can Mikayan understand Shamadam, but Shamadam cannot understand Mikayan. An overcomer's life touches the life of every man on every side, for it contains the lives of all men. Whereas no man's life touches an overcomer's life on every side. To the simplest of men the overcomer appears as the simplest of men. To the highly evolved he appears as one highly evolved. But there are always sides of him no less than an overcomer can ever feel and understand. Hence his solitude and sense of being in the world, yet not of it. The micro-god would not be confined. He is ever working for his own release from time and space confinement, using an intelligence far surpassing the human. And lower beings, men call it instinct. And ordinary men they call it treason. And higher men they designate it as prophetic sense. It is all that and much more than that. It is that nameless power which some have aptly named the Holy Spirit, and which murdered names the spirit of holy understanding. The first son of man who pieced the shell of time and crossed the bourne of space is rightly called the son of God. His understanding of his godhood is fitly called the Holy Spirit. But he assured that you also are sons of God, and in you also is the Holy Spirit working his way. Work with him and never against him. But till you pierce the shell of time and cross the bourne of space let no one say I am God. Say rather, God is I. This keep you well in mind lest haughtiness and vain imagining corrupt your hearts and militate against a holy spirit's work within you. For most men work against a holy spirit's work and thus delay their ultimate release. To conquer time you must fight time with time. To vanquish space you must let space eat space. To play the kindly host to either is to remain the prisoner of both and the hostage to the endless antics of good and evil. Those who have found their destiny and yearn to work it out lose no time coddling time and no steps pacing space. In one short lifetime they may roll up eons and annihilate stupendous bests. They do not wait on death to take them into the ovum next to theirs, they trust to life to help them piece the shells of many ova all at once. For that you must be disposed of everything, that time and space may have no hold upon your hearts. The more you possess, the more you are possessed. The less you possess, the less you are possessed. Be dispossessed of everything except you faith, your love and your yearning for release through holy understanding. Chapter 35. Sparks Upon the Godward Path. Murdered, in the stillness of this night murdered would sprinkle a few sparks upon your godward path, avoid disputes, truth is an axiom, it needs no proof, whatever must be propped with argument and proof is soon, or late knocked down with proof and argument, to prove a thing is to disprove its opposite, to prove its opposite is to disprove it, God has no opposites, how shall you prove or disprove him? To be a conduit for truth the tongue must never be a flail, a fang a weather vane, an acrobat or a scavenger, speak to relieve the speechless, be speechless to relieve yourselves, words are vessels, that ply the seas of space and touch at many ports, take care as to what you load them with, for having run their course, they shall ultimately discharge their cargo at your gate, what the broom is to the house, self-searching is to the heart, sweep well your hearts, a well-swept heart is a fortress unassailable, as you feed on men and things, so they feed on you, be wholesome food to others, if you would not be poisoned, when in doubt about the next step stand still, what you dislike dislikes you, like it and let it be, thus removing an obstacle from your path, the most unendurable nuisance is to consider anything a nuisance, take your choice, either to one all things or nothing at all, no middle course is possible, every stumbling block is a warning, 
read the warning well, and the stumbling block shall become a beacon, the straight is the brother of the crooked, the one is a short cut, and the other, a roundabout way, have patience with the crooked, patience is health when leaning upon faith, when unaccompanied by faith it is paralysis, to be, to feel to think to imagine to know, behold the order of the main stages in the circuit of human life, beware of giving and receiving praise, even when most sincere and deserved, as to flattery, be deaf and dumb to its insidious vows, you borrow everything you give, so long as you are conscious of giving, in truth, you can give naught which is yours, you only give to men, what you keep in trust for men, that which is yours, and yours alone you cannot give away, even if you desired, keep equipoise, and you shall be the standard, and the scales for men to measure, and to weigh themselves, there is nor poverty nor riches, there is a knack of using things, the really poor is he who misuses what he has, the really rich is he who well uses what he has, even a moldy crust of bread may be riches beyond computing, even a cellar stocked with gold, may be poverty beyond relief, where many roads converge do not hesitate, as to which one to follow, to a God-seeking heart all roads lead to God, approach and reverence all forms of life, in the least significant is hid the key to the most significant, all works of life are significant, yea marvelous, surpassing and inimitable, life busies not itself with useless trifles, to issue from the workshops of nature a thing must be worthy of nature's loving care and most painstaking art, should it not be worthy of your respect at least, if gnats and ants be worthy of respect, how much more, so your fellow men, Disdain no man, better to be disdained by every man than to disdain a single man, for to disdain a man is to disdain the micro-god within him. To disdain the micro-god in any man is to disdain him in yourselves. How shall he ever reach his heaven who scorns his only pilot to that heaven? Look up to see what is below, look down to see what is above, descend as much as you ascend, else you lose your balance. Today you are disciples, tomorrow you shall be teachers, to be good teachers you must remain good disciples, seek not to weed out evil from the world, for even weeds make good manure, zeal misapplied too often kills the zealot, tall and stately trees alone do not make up a forest, some underbrush and clinging vine are always necessary, hypocrisy may be driven under cover, for a while, it cannot be kept there forever nor can it be smoked out and exterminate, dark passions breed and prosper in the dark, allow them the freedom of light, if you would decrease their brood, if out of a thousand hypocrites you succeeded in reclaiming one to simple honesty, then great, indeed, is your success, set a beacon aloft, and go not about calling men to see it, those who are in need of light need no invitation to light, wisdom is a burden to the half-wise as is folly to the fool, assist the half-wise with his burden, and let the fool alone. The half-wise can teach him more that you can, often you shall think your road impassable, somber and companionless, have will and plot along, and round each curve you shall find a new companion, no road in the trackless space, is yet untraveled, where the footprints are few and far apart the road, is safe and straight, though rough in spots and lonely, guides can show the way to those who would be shown. They cannot force them to walk it. Remember that you are guides. To guide well on must be well guided. Depend upon your guide. Many shall say to you, show us the way. But few, too few shall say, lead us. We pray you in the way. On the way to overcoming, the few counts more than the many. Creep where you cannot walk. Walk where you cannot run. Run where you cannot fly. Fly where you cannot bring the whole universe to a standstill within you, not once, nor twice nor yet a hundred times must you raise the man who stumbles, while endeavoring to follow your lead, keep raising him till he stumbles no more, remembering that you, too once were babes, anoint your hearts and minds with forgiveness, that you may dream anointed dreams, life is a fever of varying intensity and kinds, depending on each man's obsession and men are ever in delirium, blessed are they who are delirious of holy freedom which is the fruit of holy understanding, 
men's fevers are transmutable. The fever of war may be transmuted into a fever of peace, the fever of hoarding wealth, into a fever of hoarding love, such is the alchemy of the spirit which you are called upon the practice and to teach, preach life to the dying, and to the living, death, but to those who yearn to overcome preach deliverance from both, vast is the difference between holding and being held, you hold, only what you love, what you hate holds you, avoid being held, more earths than one are spinning their courses across the voids of time and space, yours is the youngest of the family, and a very lusty babe she is, a still motion, what a paradox, yet that is the motion of the worlds in God, look at the fingers on your hands, if you would know how unequal things can be equal, chance is the plaything of the wise, fools are the playthings of chance, never complain of anything, to complain of a thing is to make of it a scourge for the complainer, to endure it well is to scourge it well, but to understand it is to make of it a faithful servant, it often happens, that a hunter aiming, say at a row would miss the row, and kill a hare of whose presence he was entirely unaware, a wise hunter will say in such a case, it was really the hare I had aimed at, and not the row, and I got my quarry, aim well, and any result is a good result, what comes to you is yours, what delays in coming is not worth waiting for, let it do the waiting, you never miss an aim, if what you aim at aims at you, an aim missed is always an aim attained, let your hearts be disappointment proof, disappointment is the kite hatched out by flabby hearts, and brought up on the carrions of their hopes miscarried, a hope fulfilled becomes the mother of many stillborn hopes, beware of giving your hearts in marriage unto hope, if you would not convert them into graveyards, one out of a hundred eggs spawned by a fish, may come to fruition, yet are the ninety-nine not wasted, so prodigal and so discriminately indiscriminate is nature, be you likewise prodigal and discriminately indiscriminate, in sowing your hearts and minds in the hearts and minds of men, seek no reward for any labor done, the labor itself is reward sufficient to the laborer who loves his labor, remember the creative word and the perfect balance, when you have reached that balance through holy understanding, then only shall you have become overcomers, and then shall your hands collaborate with the hands of God, may the peace and stillness of this night vibrate in you until you drown them in the stillness, and the peace of holy understanding, so taught I Noah, so I teach you. Chapter 36. Day of the Ark and its Rituals, the message from the Prince of Bether about the Living Lamp. Naranda, since the Master's return from the Bether Shamadam had been sulky and retiring, but as the day of the Ark approached he became high-spirited and vivacious, and took a personal command of all the intricate preparations down to the minutest detail, like the day of the vine, the day of the Ark had been stretched from a single day unto a whole week of lively festivities and brisk trading in all sorts of goods and chattels. Of the many rituals peculiar to this day the most important are, the slaughtering of a bullock, to be offered in sacrifice, the kindling of the sacrificial fire, and the lighting from the fire of the new lamp which is to take the place of the old one on the altar, all of which is carried on by the senior with much ceremony, the public assisting and ending by each lighting of a candle from the new lamp, which candles relater extinguished and jealously kept as talismans against evil spirits. At the end of the ceremonies it is customary for the senior to deliver an oration. The pilgrims to the day of the ark, like those to the day of the vine, rarely come without some gifts and donations of one kind or another, their majority, however bring bullocks, rams and he goats ostensibly to be scarified with the bullock offered by the ark, but in reality to be added to the ark's livestock but not slaughtered, the new lamp is usually presented by some prince or magnate of the Milky Mountains, and since it is considered a great honor and a privilege to make the present, and since the contenders are many the custom was established to settle the choice for each year by lots drawn at the close of the preceding year's festivities, the princes and the magnates v in zeal and in devotion, each aiming that his lamp should outshine all its predecessors in costliness and beauty of design and craftsmanship, 
The lot for this year's lamp was drawn by the price of Bether, and all waited to behold the new treasure, for the prince was famed for his open-handed wealth as well as for his fervor towards the ark. On the ever of that day Shamadam called us, and the master into his cell, and spoke to us as follows, addressing more the master than the rest, Shamadam, tomorrow is a holy day, and it behooves us all to keep it holy, whatever be the quarrels of the past, let us enter them here and now, the ark must not be made to slack at forward pace, or to abate its ardors, and God forbid it should be made to halt, I am the senior of this ark, mine is the onerous duty of commanding, mine is the vested right to lay the course, the duty and the right fell on me by succession, as they shall surely fall to one of you, when I am dead and gone, as I bided my time bide you your time, if I have wronged murdered, let him forgive my wrong, murdered, you have not wronged murdered, but you have wronged Shamadam very grievously, Shamadam, is not Shamadam free to wrong Shamadam? Murdered, free to do wrong, how most incongruous the very words, for to do wrong even to one's own self is to become a bondsman to one's wrong, while to do wrong to others is to become a bondsman's bondsman. Ah, heavy is the weight of wrong, Shamadam. If I be willing to support my wrong, what is that to you? Murdered, shall a diseased tooth say to the mouth, what is my pain to you, if I be willing to endure it? Shamadam, ah, let me be, just let me be. Turn your heavy hand away from me and flail me not with your clever tongue, let me live out the balance of my days as I have lived and labored hitherto, go build your ark elsewhere, but leave this ark alone, the world is wide for you and me, and for your ark and mine, tomorrow is my day, stand you aside, and let me do my work, for I shall brook no interference on the part of any one of you, take care. Shamadam's vengeance is as terrible as God's, take care, take care, Naranda. When we went out of the senior's cell the master gently shook his head and said, Murdered. Shamadam's heart is still Shamadam's heart, Naranda. On the morrow much to Shamadam's delight, the ceremonies were carried out punctiliously and without untoward incidents up to the moment when the new lamp was to be presented and lighted. At that moment a very tall and stately man, dressed in white, was seen elbowing his way with difficulty through the dense crowd and heading towards the altar, on the instant the whisper went from mouth to mouth, that the man was the personal emissary of the Prince of Bether carrying the new lamp, and all were anxious, to lay eyes upon the precious treasure, Shamadam bowed very low to the messenger believing, like the rest, that he carried the priceless gift for the new year. But the man, having said something at low breath to Shamadam, drew a parchment out of his pocket, and, after explaining that it was a message from the Prince of Bether which he was charged to deliver in person, began to read, from the erstwhile Prince of Bether to all his fellow men of the Milky Mountains assembled on this day in the Ark, peace and brotherly love, of my fervid devotion to the Ark you are all living witness, as the honor of presenting the lamp for this year fell on my lot I spared neither wit nor wealth and order, that my gift be worthy of the ark, and well were my efforts rewarded, for the lamp what my wealth, and my craftsman's cunning had finally wrought out was verily a marvel to behold, but God was forbearing and kind, and would not expose my wretched poverty, for he had led me since unto a lamp whose light is dazzling and inextinguishable whose beauty is surpassing and untarnishing, having beheld that lamp I became full of shame for having ever thought my lamp of any value whatsoever, so I consigned it to the rubbish heap, it is that living lamp not wrought with hands, which I most earnestly command to all of you, upon it feast your eyes, and from it light your candles. Behold it is within your reach, the name of it is murdered, may you be worthy of his light, Scarcely had the messenger uttered the last words when Shamadam, who had been standing by his side, suddenly vanished as if he were a ghost. The master's name went through the huge assembly like a gust of mighty wine through a virgin forest, all wished to see T. Living Lamp, of whom the Prince of Bether spoke so enticingly in his message. Presently the master was seen to mount the steps of the altar and to face the crowd, and instantly the heaving human mass became a single man, 
attentive eager and alert, then the master spoke and said. Chapter 37. The master warns the crowds of the flood of fire and blood, points the way of escape and launches his ark. Murdered, what seek you of murdered? A golden jeweled lamp to decorate the altar? But neither is murdered a goldsmith, nor a jeweler albeit he be a lighthouse and a haven, or seek you talismans, to ward off evil eyes? I talismans in plenty has murdered, but of another kind, or seek you light, that you may safely walk each in his appointed path. How very strange indeed! Have you the sun the moon, the stars yet fear to stumble and to fall? Then were your eyes unfit to serve as guides, else were the light too scanty for the eyes, and who of you would do without his eyes? Who would accuse the sun of being niggardly? Of what avail the eye, that keeps the foot from stumbling on its par, but leaves the heart to stumble, and to bleed as it gropes vainly for a path? Of what avail the light, that overfills the eye, yet leaves the spirit void and unilluminated? What seek you of murdered? If it be seeing hearts, and spirits bathed in light, that you desire, and clamor for then verily you clamor not in vain, for my concern is with the spirit and the heart of man, what brought you is an offering unto this day, which is a day of glorious overcoming. Brought you he goats, and rams and bullocks? How very cheap the price you would pay for the deliverance! Rather how very cheap is the deliverance you would buy, it were no glory for a man to overcome a goat, and verily it is a great disgrace for any man, to offer up a poor goat's life in ransom for his own. What have you done to share in the spirit of this day, which is a day of faith unfurled and love supremely justified? I to be sure, you have performed a multiplicity of rites, and mumbled many prayers, but doubt accompanied your every move, and hatred said amen to every prayer, are you not here to celebrate the conquest of the flood? How come you celebrate a victory which left you vanquished? For in subduing his own deeps Noah subdued not your deeps, but only pointed out the way, and lo your deeps are full of rage, and threaten to shipwreck you, ere you have overcome your flood, you are not worthy of this day, each of you is a flood and ark and a commander until you reach the day when you can disembark unto a freshly washed and virgin earth, be not in haste to celebrate the victory, you would know how it came about that man become a flood unto himself, when holy omni will clove Adam and a twain that he may know himself and realize his oneness with the one. Then he became a male and a female and he Adam and a she Adam, then was he deluged with desires which are the offspring of duality, desires so numerous, so infinite of hues so very greed of magnitude, so profligate and so prolific, that till this day man is a derelict upon their waves, no sooner does a wave lift him to dizzy heights, than does another drag him to the bottom, for his desires are paired as he himself is paired, and though two opposites, but complement each other in reality, yet to the ignorant they seem at grips and blows, and never willing to declare even a moment's truce, that is the flood, that man is called to breast hour by hour, day by day throughout his very long and arduous dual life, that is the flood whose mighty fountains gushes out of the heart and sweep you in their rush, that is the flood whose rainbow shall not grace your sky until your sky be wedded to your earth and made with it as one, since Adam sowed himself and Eve men have been reaping whirlwinds and floods, when passions of a kind preponderate, then is the life of men thrown out of balance, and then are men engulfed in one flood or another in order that a balance be established, and never shall the balance be adjusted till men have learned to knead all their desires in the kneading trough of love and bake of them the bread of holy understanding. The flood that overwhelmed the earth in Noah's days was not the first nor last humanity has known, it only set a high mark in the long succession of devastating floods, the flood of fire and blood which is about to break upon the earth shall surely pass the mark, are you prepared to float, or shall you be submerged? Alas! You are too busy adding weight on weight, too busy drugging your blood with pleasures rife with pain, too busy charging roads that lead you to nowhere, to busy picking seed in the backyards of the storerooms of life without, 
so much as peeping through the keyhole, how will you not go under, oh my waifs? You born to soar aloft, to roam the boundless space, to fold the universe within your wings, have cooped yourselves in coops of snug conventions and beliefs that clip your wings, impair your sight, and petrify your sinews, how shall you override the coming flood, my waifs? You images and lichens of God have well nigh blotted out the likeness in the image, your godly stature have you dwarfed till you no longer recognize it, your countenance divine have you besmeared with mud and masked with many clownish masks, how shall you face the flood you have unleashed, my waifs? Except you heed murdered, the earth shall never be to you more than a tomb, the sky more than a shroud, whereas the one was fitted out to serve you for a cradle, the other, for a throne, again I say to you, you are the flood the ark and the commander, your passions are the flood, your body is the ark, your faith is the commander, but penetrating all is your will, and hovering over all is your understanding, make certain that the ark be stanch and seaworthy, but do not waste your life on that alone, else will the time for sailing never come, and in the end both you and your ark will rot, and be submerged upon the spot, make certain of the captain's competence and calm, but above all, learn to seek out the sources of the flood, and train your will, to dry them one by one, then surely will the flood abate and finally spent itself, burn out a passion, ere it burns you out, look not into a passion's mouth to see, if it have fangs or honeyed mandibles, the bee that gathers up the nectar of the flowers gathers their poison too, nor scrutinize a passion's face, if it be comely or unsightly, more comely was to eat the serpent's face than was the face of God, nor put a passion in the scales to ascertain its weight, who would compare and weight a diadem with a mountain? Yet verily, the diadem is heavier by far than the mountain, and there be passions that carol celestial lays by day, but hiss and bite and sting under the pall of night, and passions fat, and overweighted with joy, that quickly turn to skeletons of sorrow and passion soft of eye and docile of demeanor, that suddenly become more ravenous than wolves, more treacherous than hyenas and passions scenting sweeter than a rose, so long as left alone, but stinking worse than carrions and skunks so soon as touched and plucked, sift not your passions into good and bad, for that is labor lost, the good cannot endure without the bad, and the bad can strike no root save in the good, one is the tree of good and evil, one is the fruit thereof, you cannot know the taste of good without at once knowing the taste of evil, the pap from which you suck the milk of life, the same it is that yields the milk of death, that hand rocks you in the cradle is, but the very hand that digs your grave, that is em my waifs, the nature of duality, but not so vain and obstinate as to attempt to change it. Be not so foolish as to try to split it into halves, that you may take the half you like and cast the other out, would you be masters of duality? Treat as is neither good nor evil, has not the milk of life and death turned sour in your moths? Is it not time you rinsed your mouths with something that is neither good nor bad because surpassing both? Is it not time you yearned for the fruit which is nor sweet nor bitter, because not grown upon the tree of good and evil? Would you be free from the clutches of duality? Then pluck its tree, the tree of good and evil, out of your hearts, aye, pluck a root and branch that the seed of life divine, the seed of holy understanding which is beyond all good and evil, may germinate and sprout instead thereof, a cheerless message is murdered you say, it robs us of the joy of waiting on the morrow, it makes us dumb, disinterested witness in life, when we would be vociferous contestants, for sweet is to contest no matter what the stakes at issue, and sweet to venture on a chase, even though the quarry be nothing more than a will of the wisp, so say you in your hearts, forgetting that your hearts are not yours at all, so long as good and evil passions hold their reins, to be the masters of your hearts, need all your passions, good and bad in the single trough of love and you may bake them in the oven of holy understanding, where all duality is unified in God, cease not to trouble a world already over-troubled, 
How do you hope to draw clean water from a well wherein you dump incessantly all kinds of rubbish and of mud? How shall the waters in the pool ever be clear, and still if you disturb them every moment? Draw no drafts for calm upon a troubled world, lest you be drawing drafts on trouble. Draw no drafts for love upon a hating world lest you be drawing drafts on hate. Draw no drafts for life upon a dying world lest you be drawing drafts on death. The world can pay you in no other coin except its own which is a two-faced coin, but draw upon yourselves, nor make demands on any man which you allow him not to make on you, and what is that which, if accorded you by all the world, would help you overcome your flood and disembark upon an earth divorced from pain and death and joined to heaven in everlasting love and peace of understanding? Is it possessions, power, fame? Is it authority and prestige and respect? Is it ambition crowned and hope fulfilled? Each of these is but a fountainhead which nourishes your flood, away with them, my waifs, away away, be still that you may be clear, be clear that you may clearly see the world, when you see clearly through the world, then will you know how very poor and powerless it is to give you, what you seek of freedom, peace, and life, all that the world can give you is a body, an ark in which to sail the sea of dual life, and that you owe to no man in the world, the universe is duty bound, to furnish it to you, and to sustain it, to keep it trim and stanch to breast the flood, as trim and stanch was Noah's ark, to leash the beasts therein, and have them well controlled, as Noah leashed his beasts and perfectly controlled them, that is your duty and yours alone, to have a faith bright-eyed and wide awake which to put at the helm, a faith unshaken in the omniwill which is your guide to Eden's blissful portals, that is your business and yours alone, to have a dauntless will for a commander, a will to overcome, and to partake of holy understanding's tree of life, that is again your work, and yours alone, God bound is man, no destination short of that is worthy of his pain, what if the way be long, and strewn with squalls and tails? Shall not pure-hearted, keen-eyed faith outwit the squall and override the gale? Make haste, for time bestowed on loitering, is pain-infested time, and men, even the busiest, are loiterers, indeed, shipbuilders are you all, and sailors are you all, that is the task assigned you from eternity, that you may sail the boundless ocean, which is you and therein find that voiceless harmony of being whose name is God, all things must have a center from which to radiate and round which to revolve, if life, man's life, be a circle and God finding be thereof the center, then now your work must be concentric with that center, elsewhere it loitering, though it be drenched in crimson perspiration, but since to lead man to his destiny is the business of murdered, behold, murdered is fitted out for you a wondrous ark and ark well built and well commanded, not one of gopher wood and pitch, nor one for ravens, lizards and hyenas, but one of holy understanding which shall indeed be a beacon for all who yearn to overcome her love for everything and all, nor shall her cargo be lands and chattels, or silver gold and jewels, but souls divorced from their shadows, and mantled in the light of freedom of understanding, let those who would break their moorings from the earth, and those who would be unified, and those who yearn to overcome themselves, let them come aboard, the ark is ready, the wind is favoring, the sea is calm, so taught I Noah, so I teach you, Naranda, when the master stopped, a rustling went through the hitherto motionless assembly, as if they had held their breath throughout the master's words, before descending upon the altar steps the master called for the seven and the harp, and with their aid, began to sing the hymn of the new ark, the crowd caught up the melody, and like a mighty wave swelled heavenward the sweet refrain, God is your captain, sail my ark. And that's not all, our experts and regular viewers respond to all comments. Also check if you forgot to subscribe and set your bell to receive notifications about new audiobooks and other useful self-development materials that we release regularly.
Join in the discussions, don't forget to give likes and, if possible and inspired, support the development of the channel financially. All useful links will be in the description and the first attached comment. Goodness love and wisdom to all. And now move on to watch the next part of the video at the links below, or choose something from the playlists of the channel and those you see on the screen.